countdown, we have the birthday. This man is convinced that his younger brother was once on the Titanic. He says that when he was about three or four years old, he was terrified of water. So much so that he was terrified of taking a bath. When his brother asked him why he was afraid, he said, and I quote, I was on a big ship. We hit the biggest iceberg and then it was really busy. Then I got really cold and wet and I went to a warm, bright place and waited until my next family came. Woo! Okay, that's intense. Meanwhile, his brother claims that he's super young and has never seen the Titanic or even heard about it. The strangest thing about this, the Titanic sank April 15th, 1912. His brother was born April 15th, 1992. Same day, several years later. In our eighth spot, we have the engagement ring. This next woman claims that when she was 12, she started getting memories of her being on the Titanic. She states that she would often be overwhelmed by a claustrophobic feeling and a rocking sensation, as if she was on a small room on a ship. Now, one day she ended up watching a history program on the Titanic. That's when she would see clips of passengers aboard the Titanic. The woman would clearly recognize them and remember their names before the film even mentioned who they were. She eventually visited a Titanic exhibition in Copenhagen. When she saw the reconstruction of some of the cabins, she immediately felt ill and she felt that same walking sensation. Now, the freakiest part is when she saw a ring in the exhibition which supposedly belonged to an unidentified female traveler. She immediately felt a connection to that ring and knew that it was her engagement ring. Coming in at number seven, we have Charles Lightroller. This next individual remembers being Charles Herbert Lightroller, a Royal Navy officer and the most senior member of the Titanic crew to survive the tragedy. This man remembers walking down the grand staircase and seeing all the beautiful gowns. He also remembers being on the Titanic's bridge. He always felt a connection to the Titanic and he knew that he was once on it. That's when he discovered a picture of Charles and immediately felt connected to it. He knew that that was himself. What's freaky is that in June of 2001, this man met a woman at a coffee shop while he was writing a novel about the Titanic. She came to him randomly and said, you my dear were on that ship. I see you as a tall, strongly built man wearing a dark jacket with brass buttons and a white cap with a black visor. She then proceeds to flip through one of his books he had, points to a photo of Charles and says, that's you. Okay, that is so creepy how this random woman knew. He eventually went to the Titanic exhibition in Seattle to try and bring back more memories. That's when he was flooded with them. He remembers seeing himself in a uniform and he could even hear the music playing while he saw couples dancing in the ballroom. In our sixth spot, we have Alfred Peacock. Two years after the Titanic sank, a little boy was born. While he was growing up, he had a bunch of visions surrounding the Titanic, which led him to believe that he was on the Titanic when it sank. He claims that he remembers being a two-year-old boy on the ship with his family, his mom and his little sister. When he got older, he began to remember more details, like staying in the third class cabin. He also recalled that his name started with the letter A and ended in ED, which led him to believe that his name might have been Alfred. Upon looking at the Titanic passenger list, he discovered that there was a boy named Alfred Peacock. Alfred was on the Titanic in the third class cabin with his mom and sister just like the boy claimed. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the devoted wife. When a woman named Amanda was just 19 years old, she began to have memories of her being on the Titanic. She remembers that she was a first class passenger named Julia, traveling with her family. While aboard the Titanic, she met a fellow whose name is either Marcus or Mark, who eventually turned out to be her husband. They both met aboard the Titanic and fell in love fast. When the Titanic was sinking, they both managed to survive by getting a lifeboat. They stayed in contact afterwards and eventually got married. In fact, she was at an antique store one day and saw an antique silver mirror and brush set, which triggered the memory of her using one while getting ready for her wedding. What I find fascinating though, is that Amanda claims she hasn't had a boyfriend because she feels like no one treats her as well as her past husband did. That is so cute. Like their love is just eternal. Like she still loves him many lives later. In our fourth spot, we have the dreams. Back when this individual was in third grade, she would have dreams of a bright room filled with fancy dressed people dancing. She remembers walking through the ballroom and seeing a grand staircase. Then she would wake up from the dream. She never thought anything of it until at school she watched a documentary on the Titanic. This documentary showed the ballroom. 
exactly how she dreamt of it. Before this documentary, she never heard of the Titanic, let alone seen pictures of it. 20 years later, she finds that every time she has a cold shower, she starts to gasp as if she can't breathe. One time while in the shower, she closed her eyes and had a vision of her drowning in the cold waters. To this day, she occasionally has dreams or flashbacks to the time that she was aboard the ship. Coming in at number three, we have Bess Waldo Daniels. This next individual remembers being a woman named Bess Waldo Daniels aboard the Titanic. She discovered that she was Bess when she saw a picture of Bess's husband and children and realized that they looked exactly like the individuals from her own visions. She remembers the early life as Bess, the memories from her childhood, all the way up to the day that she passed away on the Titanic. She had a husband named Hudson and three children, Helen, Hudsey, and Lorraine. She remembers being in their stateroom when her husband came in and told them to follow him out to the boat deck. She remembers him saying that it's not safe to take the elevator, so they had to take the stairs. She then gets in a boat with her baby while sounds of panic fill the air. In the boat, she was with complete strangers. She handed her baby to one man with curly blonde hair while she stood up to look for her husband. Then, all she remembers is that the boat rocked and she fell into the icy cold waters. In her second spot, we have Bridget O'Sullivan. A woman named Jackie is adamant that she was once a woman named Bridget O'Sullivan, who was a passenger on the Titanic. She remembers being a third class passenger. When the Titanic was sinking, she was in a small room with something blocking the door, making her trapped inside the room. She remembers seeing the water pour in through the door. The ship tipped and a large trunk slid and hit her left hip. The room fills with water and she drowns. Turns out Bridget O'Sullivan was a real person who indeed was a passenger on the Titanic. In fact, when Jackie found a picture of Bridget, she claims that they both looked identical when they were the same age. And in our number one spot, we have the boy named Jamie. Now, Jamie's story was even featured on the show Ghost Inside My Child, which is a show about children who may have been reincarnated. Now, ever since Jamie was little, he had a huge fear of water, which is weird considering that his whole family loves swimming and water. He would only go as far as standing on the pool's steps, and he would freak out if he went any further in. His family also claims that he would suffer from terrible night terrors, where he would basically wake up panicked and would sprint around the house into each room as if he was trapped and trying to find his way out. This would happen almost every night. Now, it doesn't stop there. One time when Jamie was learning to ride his bike, he said he remembers seeing his mom ride her blue bike. Well, apparently when his mom was little, she would ride a blue bike, but never when she was older. When his mom asked how he knew this, he said, there are windows in heaven, mama. Ooh. There were also other unusual things about Jamie. Around the age of four, he would say port and starboard instead of left and right. And he would also say some words with a slight English accent. One day, Jamie ended up watching the ending of the Titanic thanks to his babysitter. And this heightened everything. From there, he would constantly draw images of the ship, some containing great detail showing the different levels and all the rooms. He even knew facts about the ship that a five-year-old possibly couldn't have known. Like, how one time he drew a ship with four smokestacks, but he only drew smoke coming out of three. His mom asked him why one wasn't working, and he said, that's a dummy stack, it's just for show. And this is true, apparently they only used three of the smokestacks, but thought four looked better, so one was just fake. Now, Jamie also would be overcome by guilt constantly. He repeatedly would tell his mom that the tragedy shouldn't have happened, and he said, and I quote, mistakes were made and corners were cut. He said that the men in the boiler rooms shouldn't have been trapped. He also said that the boat should have been made out of iron instead of steel. This, among all the other facts, led his mom to believe that his son helped build the ship or was a worker aboard the ship. Coming in at number nine is the wealth gap. There were three classes of passengers aboard the ship, as we already know. First class, two third, the richest are in first class and vice versa. The Titanic did a brilliant job of at least making the third class passengers feel more privileged by giving them closed off private rooms as opposed to a dormitory type situation. But the same can't be said about rescue crews who were doing damage control on the ship. In order to prioritize the remains of the first and second class passengers, they literally just started throwing the bodies of third class passengers into the ocean. The evidence was written in excruciating detail in a series of telegrams between the White Star Line and the recovery ship tasked with the issue. So while most of the second and first class passengers' bodies were returned to their families and were given proper burials, most of the third class families were kept in the dark about their loved ones. Plot twist, the wage gap didn't get any better. 
100 years later, spit facts only. At number eight, we have ignored. So the death count of the crash was estimated to be between 1,500 to 1,635 people out of the 2,224 people on board altogether. Now, most of them died of hypothermia after the sinking while they were waiting in vain to be rescued from the freezing water. But the casualties could have been so much lower because 20 miles away, the SS Californian was floating idle waiting for the ice to clear. I bet they wanted to be them right about then. The captain of the ship even saw all of Titanic's crisis flares but ignored them because he assumed they were just simply company rockets. Bro, I would have come back from the dead just to be like, bro, what the F are you doing, bro? We're out here dying. All the SOS signals weren't received till the next day, so by the time the Californian dragged its there, they found nothing but bodies. Too little, too late. Filling on number seven slot are the tears. Now, the commonly believed fact is that the iceberg essentially caused the Titanic to split in half. We saw it in the movie, we saw people sliding to the other side of the ship. It was all happening, and we saw it. Now, before actually discovering the wreckage of the ship, experts believe there was only one 300 foot tear in the middle of the ship. Plot twist, it wasn't. But after examining the wreckage, it was a whole other ball game. There were actually six separate tears going through the ship, all totaling 15 feet. But I mean, I had no idea that was a big enough hole to sink a ship that was almost 900 feet long. Almost. 882. Nearly there. Now at number six is the trusted captain. The captain of the Titanic was Edward Smith and he obviously caught a lot of slack for being the captain of the ship that endured the worst maritime tragedy ever, but in reality, he wasn't that bad. Smith was one of the most seasoned sea captains out there, so much so he even had fans and a low-key cult following. Some passengers wouldn't even go on Atlantic voyages unless Smith was the captain of the vessel. So for a captain with that kind of reputation to then go down in history for his folly on the night of the crash is just crazy to me, like mind blown. Coming in at number 5 is the full moon. Now when it comes down to blame, we can blame the lookouts for not doing their job properly, we can blame lack of visibility, but scientists believe the real blame for the tragedy is the moon. Wind causes waves for the most part, but it's the gravitational pull of the sun and moon on earth that causes proper tidal waves. So based on that, researchers have concluded that the full moon on the 4th of January 1912 could have caused the abnormally strong tide tides that move the big iceberg southward right in time to hit the Titanic on her maiden voyage. That was the closest lunar approach the Earth had experienced since the year 796, so I feel like they ain't wrong. They ain't wrong. And number four is a premonition. So 14 years prior to Titanic's maiden voyage, the author Morgan Robertson wrote a novella called Futility and the subject matter was a sinking ship. That ship was called the Titan and the whole story had eerily similar details to the Titanic. In Futility, Titan is the largest ship of its time and so was the Titanic. In reality, they were both roughly the same size, the Titanic being 25 meters longer and both were described as unsinkable and both hit an iceberg mid-April. Both ships even carried the bare legal minimum number of lifeboats aboard despite having a ton of passengers. I mean, even the names of both ships are two letters off. Like, are we just, are we just gonna ignore that? I don't think we should. Morgan was accused of being psychic, but he replied saying, I know what I'm writing about, that's all. He was an experienced seaman, he knew his subject matter well, and that's all it was. And although I believe Morgan, it's still just very creepy. Filling on number three slot is Till Death Do Us Part. Now, amongst the many important passengers aboard the ship, two of them were Isidore and Ida Strauss, the magnates of Macy's, the department store. As the ship started going down, the attendants were rushing Ida into a lifeboat, but she flat out refused to leave Isidore behind and Isidore himself refused to leave on a lifeboat and leave any men behind on the ship. So the couple would decide to sacrifice themselves and go down together. The last thing she was heard saying was, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so will we die together. And the last time they were seen was on the deck, arms wrapped around each other in that last embrace. Now that is a real ride or die right there. All your other ride or dies, fake. Cancel it. Done. It's them two. Name a better duo, I'll wait. Now, at number two is the fatal turn. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of what happened and who was contacted when the iceberg was spotted because I feel like we've talked about that part of it to death. Now let me set the scene. When the chief officer on the bridge received that iceberg warning, the first thing he did was tell the hemsman to turn the wheel and that was the biggest mistake he could have made. Researchers who've studied the ship's trajectory have concluded that the collision could have been completely avoided had the order to turn not been made. The Titanic was actually equipped with collision bulkheads 
lights in the bow, so had the ship hit the iceberg head on, it would have most likely survived. The damages that would have incurred from the head on impact would have either slowed down the sinking considerably, giving people more time to board lifeboats, or it would have saved the ship entirely. That guy was probably like, I made a grave mistake. And that you have. And finally, at number one is the show must go on. This was just so heartbreaking to me, but I felt like I just had to share it with you guys. I'm sorry if it's a downer. So Dorothy Gibson, a well-known actress of the time, was actually aboard the Titanic and experienced a terrible tragedy for herself. She thankfully survived the incident, but her producers were hounding her to star in a film about the sinking of the Titanic weeks after the crash happened. Like, can we take a moment? Can we take a moment? Dorothy refused to star in Save from the Titanic countless times, she kept being pressurized into it because producers were convinced that the film would do amazing. The whole thing was shot in a week, with Dorothy having multiple breakdowns during filming and having fits of hysterical crying. When it was finally released less than a month after the real event, it did horribly. It bombed. Critics thought it was so insensitive that someone would make a movie about one of the worst maritime tragedies not even a month after it happened. And the fact that Gibson somehow survived filming it was also beyond them. They took too soon to a whole other level. Starting off with number 10 is the inspection card. Passenger Marion, meanwhile, originally had different travel plans, but when a coal strike delayed her scheduled trip on the Majestic, she came aboard the Titanic. On the inspection card, you can see her name and the Majestic crossed out and replaced with the Titanic instead. Marion didn't survive the shipwreck, and the card really just makes you think. They were probably on a time constraint, rushing to get somewhere, and thought if the Titanic is the quickest and soonest way to get there, then the Titanic it'll be. Not having any idea of what that split decision would do. But then again, none of them knew, right? Coming in at number nine is Amy. A bracelet was recovered from the shipwreck of the Titanic and auctioned off a hundred years after the ship sank. The bracelet itself looks like a gold chain and it has Amy in the middle made from silver and diamonds. Honestly, there was something about it that just struck me as eerie. Maybe it's the fact that Amy is probably dead right now and she could have been wearing that when the ship hit the iceberg and everything was just going down. And I think it's all the possibilities behind the bracelet, which is what makes it scary. Was she sliding to the other side of the ship and the bracelet got caught on something and came off? Was it part of her luggage that went down with the ship? We'll never know. Maybe it didn't even belong to an Amy. Maybe a man had gotten it for his wife or girlfriend and was going to give it to her when the ship docked. We'll just never know. At number eight, we have the plan. This was the blueprint of the Titanic drawn by the Naval Architects Department at White Star Line, which was the company that owned the Titanic. Sold for 308,000 euros at an auction, the plan is actually one of the most important important pieces of memorabilia we have because it was heavily used for investigation after the disaster to see if the ship itself had any role to play in the crash. Were there any faulty areas, any super vulnerable spots that perhaps they missed in planning, etc. Witnesses and survivors of the crash were shown the plan so they could point out where exactly the ship hit the iceberg and those points are still marked onto the plan. The drawing itself is an actual marvel. It's a whopping 9.2 meters long which surprised me initially but given how big the starline was herself, it just doesn't surprise me at all. Filling our number seven slot is the trunk. There are many stories explaining why Howard Irwin never boarded the Titanic when he was meant to. One story was that because he was a heavy gambler, he was beaten up and kidnapped and forced to work on a ship going to the Middle East. That's some Jason Bourne ting right there. He was supposed to go to New York with his friend Henry Sutor, and so when Henry got on the ship on April 10th, he brought Howard's trunk with him, expecting to meet him later on. And of course, he never did. They recovered at Howard's trunk from the shipwreck and he's obviously still alive, hopefully back home and not still working on a ship somewhere, but his friend Henry didn't survive. Now at number six are the keys. They actually did a really good job of conserving these keys. I thought they'd be rusty and old and water damaged, but they look like they're in tip top shape. This specific set was used by Titanic crewman Samuel Hemming, who was the storekeeper of the ship. He was ordered to use it to unlock the door where the lifeboat lanterns were kept to make sure all 15 lifeboats had lit oil lamps. This this was done soon after the captains realized doom was inevitable and that there was no way they were going to avoid the iceberg. Honestly, just imagine being told you have to do that and why. He was probably trying to comprehend near imminent death whilst making sure all the lamps were on. Real MVP right there. 
You go, Samuel. Coming in at number five is the violin. Sold for 1.5 million euros, this violin belonged to Wallace Hartley, who was part of the band who did live entertainment for the ship. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that the violin player starts playing when the ship goes down, and the rest of the band just joins in to kind of, you know, mask the sound of chaos and death around everyone. And you'd think that that was just for effect, since it is a movie and they're trying to pull at your heartstrings, but it actually happened. Wallace did grab his violin during the ship's last few critical moments and started playing Nearer My God to Thee, inspiring his bandmates to do the same. Honestly, imagine that being the soundtrack of your death. I don't know if I'm into it. At number four is the robe. I think the robe was meant to be beige originally, but after spending so long on the ocean floor, it turned this light greenish color. The silk kimono style robe was worn by a first class passenger called Lucy Christiana, whereas other reports say it was worn by Lady Duff Gordon. Either way, she wore it as she was escaping the ship and hurrying into a lifeboat, and then later the RMS. Carpathia. Honestly, that is a fancy ass getaway outfit if I ever saw one, but I'm not even surprised. I feel like people probably just ran for safety, regardless of if they were wearing a three piece suit or were completely naked. I would have taken it off, you know, to be able to run faster, but they were also getting into lifeboats into freezing water, so the cover up makes complete sense. Filling our number three slot is the pocket watch. To 2008, this was actually the most expensive Titanic artifact sold in an auction. It was sold for 130,000 euros, which is a around 146,000 USD. It belonged to a first class steward on the ship called Edmund Stone, who also owned the master keys to the whole first class cabin, so he was pretty up there. Eerily enough, the watch stopped ticking at exactly 2.16am, which would have been around the time Edmund landed in the ice cold water of the ocean. Now this is a proper relic frozen in time. I feel when I read that sentence while I was researching this video, it almost made me flash back to seeing this man's arm go into the Atlantic Ocean, even though I wasn't even there. It honestly gives me chills and I don't know if it's because the fact it stopped when he died is freaky or I'm just imagining this cold water all over me. Let me know. Actually you can't. Scratch that. Now at number two is the last lifeboat. Collapsible A was the last lifeboat to leave the Titanic. Not everyone survived, but most of them were saved by Oceanic. A month after the sinking, it was recovered and workers were doing their best to patch it back up. But what they found inside the lifeboat made them speechless. Inside Collapsible A, they found the decomposing bodies of three passengers. One was wearing a dinner jacket, later identified as first class passenger Thompson Beatty, and the other two bodies were firemen that had just been stuffed under the lifeboat seats. One of their arms even came off as the boarding officer was trying to move them. A wedding ring was found too, but I guess Oceanic left the dead bodies behind when they were saving the rest. The ring belonged to Elon Lindell, who got to the lifeboat but later drowned. Her husband held the ring on collapsible A till he too died, and his body has never been recovered. And finally, at number one is the letter. I think this is one of the most profound artifacts that was recovered from the Titanic, but also one of the most spine chilling. April 14th, 1912, the Titanic hit the iceberg. Two and a half hours later, the ship sank with 1,500 people aboard. During that two and a half hours, first class passenger Dr. Washington Dodge decided to write a letter. Even his name sounds bougie, I'm not surprised he was first class. In the letter, he vividly describes the ship's final hours, the sinking, the chaos, the loss. It's one of the earliest, most immediate accounts of the disaster ever found. His handwriting is all over the place, which I'm sure you can understand given his state of mind. But he did in fact survive the shipwreck, so I guess it wasn't all bad after all. I mean, what am I saying? It, it, it was all bad. It was all bad. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the SOS. It said that the Titanic frantically radioed messages as the crew realized she was doomed. But since the incident was late at night, many ships nearby had their radios turned off. However, some ships did respond, and even Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, sent word that they were coming to help. Legend has it that a passing ship, the Samson, saw Titanic's flares but carried on without a second glance. But in reality, the Samson was nowhere near the Titanic. The one ship that could have made it in time was the Californian but they didn't receive calls for help. The first ship to reach Titanic survivors was the RMS Carpathia, two hours after the sinking. In our fourth spot, we have the curses. Out of all the Titanic curses, you'd think that at least one of them would be true. Well, White Star Line made a point of not holding launching spectacles for their ship when it's often a common practice to, for like, good luck. On most ships debuts, companies would make a ceremony of transferring the new ship into the water. This involved cheering, blessings, and large crowds often smashing a bottle of champagne off the bow as a sacrifice. 
Thing is, White Star Line never participated in such ceremonies with any of their ships. Meaning that if this legend is true, the Titanic wasn't blessed or properly bid good luck. And that's why she sank. Moving on to number three, we have the deliberate sinking. The Titanic is known as a huge disaster in history. The tragedy missed the onset of the First World War by two years. But some still speculate that a German U-boat was really behind the ship sinking. A number of Titanic survivors reported to have noticed an unidentified vessel approximately five to six miles away from the sinking ship which reportedly lingered until 2 a.m. According to Dr. Franklin Rule's piece in the Huffington Post, Rule speculated that the craft was possibly a submarine that had surfaced to assess the damage it had caused to the Titanic. He also cited survivor testimony about a number of explosions that seemed to go off deep within the ship. He claims the sub may have deliberately targeted the luxury liner or possibly accidentally collided with it. In our second spot, we have the lookout. Apparently, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee, who were crewmen on the Titanic, didn't have access to binoculars during the journey, and therefore couldn't see very far. The ship's second officer was replaced at the last minute and forgot to hand off the key to the lockers that housed the ship's binoculars. The key resurfaced at an auction in 2010, where it was sold for over $130,000. According to the official 1912 inquiry findings, only 37 seconds elapsed between actually seeing the iceberg, calling down stairs, and deciding what course of action to take. Fleet was the lookout who called out the now famous words, iceberg right ahead. He survived the sinking, but tragically went on to die by suicide in 1965 after the death of his wife. On the centennial anniversary of the Titanic sinking, a prankster removed a memorial reef from his gravestone and replaced it with a pair of binoculars and a note apologizing for the lateness of the binoculars. And in our number one spot, we have the conspiracy theory. This rumor has everything you could ever want in a conspiracy theory. A man powerful and wealthy enough to play God, overly complicated methods of assassination, a mass casualty event, the Federal Reserve Bank. There's a theory out there that JP Morgan sank the Titanic in order to pave the way for the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank in the US. The bank's creation was reportedly opposed by millionaire John Jacob Astor, Benjamin Guggenham, and Macy's co-owner Isidore Strauss. These three wealthy men did indeed lose their lives when the Titanic sank, but Morgan dodged death and disaster when he canceled his trip in the 11th hour. This dude owned the IMM, which in turn owned the White Star Line. Morgan was reportedly supposed to be on the ship, but decided to skip the voyage at the last second. How convenient. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported that he decided to linger in Europe in order to buy tapestries for his art collection. But what reason would Morgan have to allegedly sink his own ship? Well, conspiracy theorists say that in interest of clearing away opposition to the Federal Reserve Bank, Morgan somehow manipulated all of his rivals to sail on the ship so that he could sink it. But Leighton pointed out that it's almost unimaginable that Morgan could have gotten all three of his major rivals to take the same trip. Like, what are the odds? He says, surely there had to be an easier way to carry out the plan. Even more importantly, how is it that no one came forward in the century since and said, yes, I helped to set up the sinking of the Titanic in order to kill three men who were opposed to the formation of the US Federal Reserve. So kicking things off just like that, and at number 10 is The Wreck of the Titan. A book published nearly 15 years before the sinking of the Titanic might have actually predicted its fate. Well, this book was named Wreck of the Titan after it had a name change. Well, it mentioned a ship that was the largest one to exist at the time and was deemed unsinkable. Sound familiar? Yeah, I think so. Well, in the book, the ship hit an iceberg and sank, killing a large number of people due to a shortage of lifeboats. Sounds a little bit familiar, right? Well, next up on this list, in at number 9, is The Curse. One legend claims that the Titanic was cursed. Well, on an account that it was being built by Protestants instead of Catholics, the Titan was in fact built in Belfast, Ireland, which had a large number of Protestants and a few Catholics, which made the chances of hiring a Catholic slimmer. But a lot of the press twisted this story, implying that the manufacturers were 
were vehemently anti-Catholics, and the White Star Line's practice of not Christianing their ships placed a curse upon them. So religion has a lot to do with this one. And at number eight, we have a coal fire sank the ship. I know this theory has been going around for many, many years. Well, a newer theory states that a coal fire was actually responsible for the sinking of the ship. So why are we talking about this iceberg? And that's what wreaked havoc to the structure. Well, experts say that the coal fire, which actually did happen, but many say that it wasn't the cause of the sinking of the Titanic. Well, it was known long before the Titanic set sail. So the fire was happening and then the Titanic set sail. But for some reason, there was no concern about the fire. So I'm not sure what's going on with this one. So let's move right along. And at number seven, we have sacrificial sinking. Another legend says that the Titanic was actually sacrificed by the crew because after it was built, it was expected that you would end up losing the company money. So you kind of know where I'm going with this one. People who defended this theory back it up by arguing that since the crew received a warning of icebergs, yet continued to go north instead of south, instead of going south out of their path, then this is why the speculations are saying that they might have intended to sink it. They were going right to the icebergs. Number six is actually one of the more popular theories on this list about the Titanic. It states that the Titanic never sank. Yeah, you heard that right. A lot of people don't even believe this. It's almost like the moon landing theory. There's speculations on both sides. And you know what? I've heard compelling arguments on both sides. I think the moon landing happened. Let me know if you guys think. And let me know if you guys think the Titanic never sank. Sound off in the comment section below. Well, some people claim that it never sank sank. That's not to say that they don't believe a ship sank. They just think it was another ship, the Olympic. Apparently the Olympic was scheduled to be repaired after it was damaged, but the white star lines couldn't justify the price. Instead, they swapped it out with the Titanic knowing that it would sink on the way and then they'll be able to collect the Titanic's insurance money instead. Honestly, out of all these theories, this one may not sound too far-fetched. All right, number five is the Egyptian curse. Okay, so part of this urban legend has already been disproven. Allegedly, this one states that on board the Titanic, there was an ancient Egyptian mummy that was cursed. Legend has it that it has already brought traumas to its previous handlers, including a loss of loved ones, loss of money, loss of life. Apparently, there was somebody in the US who wanted to buy it, but on the faithful trip overseas, the mummy cursed the Titanic and caused it to sink. So it was no iceberg, it was no fire, it was actually this mummy. Apparently, there was no proof that it it was ever on the Titanic though, so this was quickly debunked. The mummy is sitting in a British museum, so if it was on board the Titanic, wouldn't it have sank with it? Next up, number four is the Captain caused even more deaths than necessary. Despite a lot of people praising Captain Smith as being a hero during the sinking of the Titanic, he was directly responsible for a lot more people dying than necessary. More accurately, the captain knowingly left a lot of the seats in the lifeboats vacant, sometimes filling boats with a 65 person capacity with fewer than 30 people. So what is going on there? Yeah, it's true that there weren't enough lifeboats for the amount of people on board, but it's more than likely that if he ordered for these boats to be filled to capacity, a lot more people would have survived. Our number three spot is all about class inequality. This is one myth that was heavily popularized by the James Cameron movie, Titanic. And a scene that depicted the third class passengers being locked below deck to prevent them from taking up room on the lifeboat while they weren't technically locked downstairs in real life, it was incredibly difficult for them to get above deck. They had to make their way through a labyrinth of halls and staircases, and some of these exits were blocked off. There were also no lifeboats on the third deck class decks, just the first and second class decks. It seems to me, and let me know if you guys can dispute this one, but is this ship designed for only the wealthy to survive in case of a crash? In at number two, there's a legend that claims that men dressed as women to con their way onto lifeboats. So this one is pretty self-explanatory in my opinion. We all saw the movie, they took women and kids first. We saw some men trying to jump on. Uh, if this was me, I would fight to survive. So I would try to dress as a woman to try to get on that boat. You got to fight for survival. When the Titanic was sinking, women and children were the first to be boarded on. Well, leaving men to just wait behind and for somehow they were going to swim to shore, swim to an island, uh, be saved. Okay, let's be honest here. Let's not sugarcoat this. They were just left 
to die on the ship. Well, some men allegedly worked their way around this rule by dressing up as women and getting in the lifeboats in disguise. And a number one goes to time traveling tourists. The theory of time travel has existed pretty much forever. And some people think that it's a result of some big moments in history. I wish I can time travel to the early 2019 and tell people about this COVID-19 virus and a way to avoid it. And maybe having it contained in the city that it started so we can avoid this global pandemic. Well, going back to this urban legend, this urban legend claims that a bunch of people from the future decided to use time travel to go check out the Titanic. But there was one problem. They all appeared at the same time. And okay, I know it gets a little bit crazy with this one, but because they appeared all at the same time, they added weight to the ship. I mean, all these new passengers weren't accounted for and that's how the ship sank. This is probably the, one of the most far-fetched things that I've ever heard. And I'm just gonna debunk it now and say, no, time travel doesn't exist. So how can this be possible? Well, there you guys have it. I just wanna say thank you guys so much for watching this video. That was the top 10 scary Titanic urban legends. That might be true. I mean, everything on this list could be plausible. Who are we to rule anything out? Well, even though this happened over a hundred years ago, we may never know all the secrets that went along with the Titanic itself. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that wasn't true even in the slightest. It turns out the entire thing could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions on the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 9 spot today, we have the futility. This is more so something that happened prior to the fateful day of the Titanic sinking, but it's still quite unsettling and also kind of bizarre nonetheless. In 1898, a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail, but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man is it really weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he was to guess it would be kind of rude to just write a book about it rather other than, I don't know, warn someone? In our number eight spot today, we have true love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ships started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida, however, refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead, they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said, quote, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just such a testament to how much they loved each other. I'm very glad that they had one another in those very frightening moments. In our number seven spot today, we have Take My Spot. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble, but it's also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news is that both his wife and the child she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal, which also likely means that the children he 
he gave his spot up for also survived. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also hear quite a few about the bravery people showed during this tragic event. In our number 6 spot today, we have the lifeboat. Before the Titanic set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we are talking about the safety of the 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that, should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply were just not up to par. In our number 5 spot today, we have the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. This may seem like a mundane find, but it revealed a very grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card showed that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. There clearly is no way anyone could have known or warned her, it's just a really tragic situation all around. In our number 4 spot today, we have slow action. While we were just talking about lifeboats, I mentioned how there wasn't enough time to launch all of the ones on board. This is true, and while the Titanic sank fairly quickly, there would have been more time if only people were more prepared. What I mean is that from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg, until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill, and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. This means that there are likely many lives that could have been saved had they had some more direction or prior training. In our number 3 spot today, we have ignored help. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking of the Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously? It's obviously not their fault, but it definitely makes you think. In our number 2 spot today, we have the band. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that would still have been insanely brave of them, but as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger to leave but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. In our number one spot today, we have Wrong Turn. Okay, so we talked about how many warnings about the iceberg were ignored, but what happened when people finally stopped ignoring them? 
Well, once the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely they would have known that at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They said that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly, which would have given more time for people to be rescued. It's easy for us to look back and say this would have been the best move, but under that kind of pressure, it's tough to see things as clearly as we can right now. Starting us off with number 10 is a last minute decision. Now this was shared by Sylvia Kuzman, whose grandpa had three tickets for the Titanic. Now it was 1911 and rumors about war were rife in Europe and boys as young as 12 were at risk of getting enlisted. So to save himself and his two sons, Sylvia's grandpa thought they could start a new life in America. They left Macedonia by train for France and when they got there, her grandpa realized people were willing to spend a lot of money for the white star line tickets that they had. So on a whim, he decided to sell them instead and take a different ship the following day. And when they got to Ellis Island the next day, they had no idea why everyone was crying so much until they realized this ship they were meant to board the previous day was the Titanic. Coming in at number 9 is the unsinkable. Molly Brown was one of the most famous survivors of the Titanic and after the wreckage she said this while being interviewed, typical brown luck, we're unsinkable. And the woman was courageous, I'll give her that. Crewmen had to rip her away from helping other passengers and had to physically push shown to lifeboat 6. She then started arguing with the quartermaster Robert Hitchens who was in charge of the boat. She urged him to turn the hell around and save more passengers because lifeboat 6 was the infamous one that left the ship without even being half full with passengers. What a waste people but we'll get into that later. At number 8 we have John Jacob Astor. Now this American businessman was the richest passenger aboard the Titanic and rumored to be one of the richest people in the world at that time. His net worth was close to 87 million dollars when he died which is about 2.3 billion dollars today. Now, despite being a first class passenger and presumed to be snobby, he genuinely wasn't. He safely got his pregnant wife Madeline on a lifeboat and asked if he could get on with her to protect her but was refused. All the women and children had to board before the men could. So he got told the number of her lifeboat and waited. As the time finally came and he was about to board the lifeboat, he saw two terrified children on deck and gave up his place on the lifeboat for the two kids. He sacrificed himself Himself, his child's future father for two helpless children and I think that's pretty damn honourable. Filling on number 7 slot is the bacon. Now most passengers who died, died mostly from hypothermia or they drowned, there is a no in between. However the ship's baker Charles Joffin had a different approach in mind. Charles managed to survive in the freezing cold water for over 2 hours before he was rescued. How did he manage the impossible? Because of all the whiskey he had drunk on the ship before it went down. He claimed he was treading in the water and barely felt the temperature which I feel like great for him but I don't know if I would have been able to survive that and paddle if I was drunk and it really was a 50-50 because either alcohol can slow your heat loss or it can increase your risk of getting hypothermia so it really was a life or death bargain. I think he was reported saying that he knew he was going to die so he wanted to die drunk. That paid off didn't it Charles? Yes it did. Now at number 6 is collapsible be lifeboat. In a situation like that you can very well imagine how frantic and terrified everyone was from the first emergency bell going off to the very end. The collapsible B was one of the four collapsible boats aboard the Titanic but sadly it was never launched. While the crew was trying to fasten it to the davits, it fell off the roof and landed upside down on the boat's deck. The water then washed over that area just as that happened and so collapsible B was being washed away from the ship. But desperate times call for desperate measures. 30 people, mostly crewmen, ended up clinging to life somehow by standing on top of the boat. But on boats like this, I'm just thinking about how how all of them would stand on a curb surface like that and survive and not fall in. Coming in at number 5 are the icebergs. Honestly if the Titanic had delayed its maiden voyage by a month or two, I can guarantee it wouldn't have met the tragic demise that it did. April 1912 saw 300 plus icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes which was the highest number seen within this route in over half a century. The high influx of icebergs was due to the fact that winter that year was warmer than usual, hence more ice was getting dislodged and thus more icebergs icebergs were travelling towards that route. 
talk about wrong place, wrong time. At number four are the engineers. Thanks to the dedicated Scottish and British engineers aboard the ship, a lot of people were saved that actually wouldn't have been. The men stayed behind and worked effortlessly until the ship actually went under. None of the lights on the ship went out until it was fully underwater. The men spent the whole time keeping the pumps running and the electricity going, which helped the crew get the passengers on the lifeboat. Lights aside, they also kept the radio running, which sent out distress signals up until a few minutes before the ship was submerged. One of the last signals heard by the Carpathia was engine room full up to boilers, aka full of water. Out of the 25 engineers, not a single one survived. If anyone was a real MVP on this boat, it was definitely the 25 men right there. Filling at number three slot is watertight. Now, designs of the Titanic would make you think the fleet was airtight. It had a double bottom, as well as 15 watertight bulkhead compartments that were equipped with further watertight doors. That's a lot of me saying watertight, doesn't it? So with all those extra precautions in place, what the hell went wrong besides the big tears in the ship's side? Well, it turns out the walls separating the bulkheads allowed water to get in from one compartment to another. Other, hence the foolproof design ended up having a pretty huge fatal flaw. Now at number two are furry friends. People dying is sad of course, but pets dying is even sadder for some reason. First class passengers aboard the Titanic were allowed to bring their dogs while on board, and so there were about 12 confirmed dogs on the ship. Of those 12, only three got a happy ending as they were smuggled onto lifeboats and taken to New York. The rest sadly drowned with the rest of the passengers. And finally at number one is the survival rate. Now this one triggered me. Iceberg or no iceberg, if anything happened to the Titanic, there was no way everyone was going to survive. If anything, they actually ensured that there'd be no conceivable way that everyone aboard would survive. 2,224 people were aboard that ship, and despite having 16 lifeboat davits that could each lower three boats, making the total 48. The Titanic only carried 20 lifeboats, and four of those were collapsible, which ended up being problematic as hell and very hard to launch, as I mentioned with collapsible beams. Each lifeboat had the capacity to hold 65 people, and the collapsible ones were able to hold 47. Now, let's do some quick maths, yeah? If at full capacity, the normal lifeboats could have saved 1,300 passengers, while the collapsible ones could have saved 188 passengers. Now, best case scenario, at full capacity, nothing going wrong, that still leaves 736 people dead. We know getting collapsible A and B was a sh show, so honestly, this was built in death. Starting us off with number 10 is the stupid mistake. Now, most ships have lookouts, people that specifically just have to look into the distance to make sure the ship isn't going to hit anything, there are no obstacles in the far distance. It's basically just like a damage prevention job, but on the Titanic, the lookouts were hugely disadvantaged to the point that had this mistake not occurred, the ship would not have sunk at all. Frederick Flea and Reginald Lee were the assigned lookouts for the Titanic, but they operated the whole journey without any binoculars. The ship's second officer was fired and replaced at the last minute, and he forgot to give the key to the locker that had the binoculars in it to Flea and Lee. Hence, they had to rely on just their eyesight the whole time, and obviously, that's just not very reliable. I mean, our eyes can only see so far, and especially at night or in foggy conditions, that's as good as being blind. Now, crew saw the iceberg 37 seconds before they hit it. With binoculars, you bet your ass they would have seen that a lot sooner and been able to change course easily. The key was finally found in 2010 and auctioned off for a whopping $130,000. Coming in at number 9 are the bad omens. Now I don't want to say the Titanic was doomed before it even set sail, but there were some red flags, there was some foreshadowing bad omens, that's just, that's all I'm going to say. Now during the construction of the ship, 8 workers died, 3 of which are still unknown. We don't know their names since many of the workers weren't registered, they were just kind of there to make some extra money, and the heads in charge were fine with that. Not only that, but 246 injuries were reported during her construction, so all that already happened before the ship was even done, let alone set sail. Now the day it set sail, April 10th, 1912. As she was leaving the Southampton dock, she nearly crashed into the New York that was moored nearby. As the Titanic was leaving, the ropes holding the New York snapped, and so it was drifting into the Titanic's path, so crewmen on the steamliner quickly used water from the propeller to push the other ship away. So there have been deaths, there have been injuries, and it nearly crashed minutes into leaving the dock. I don't want to say doom was expected, but I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Say no more. 
You guys can make your own conclusions. I'm just giving you the facts, straight facts only. At number eight, we have the safety drills. Now, this was actually part of one of the survivors' testimonies, but while aboard the ship, they shared that every Sunday, without fail, they would have a lifeboat drill. Like, without fail, rain or shine, the drill would definitely happen. And April 14th was the last Sunday before the crash, and although technically it's written down as sinking on the 14th, it actually sank at 2 a.m. on the 15th, if we're being specific. You know, if we're being nitpicky. Either way, that day, the very day of the tragedy to come, the lifeboat drill just never happened. No one knows why. Maybe the captain thought the passengers had gotten the gist of it by now. I don't really know. But for some reason, the drill just never happened. And it sure as sh it should have, since it would have helped a bunch of people get onto the lifeboats quicker and faster and safer rather than the stampede that it actually was. But also, that's just really suspicious the fact it didn't happen. Like, why? Why on that day specifically did it not happen? Illuminati confirmed. Filling our number seven slot is fake news. Now, when the Titanic sank, the news traveled pretty quickly since her voyage was so hyped up everywhere. Everyone knew of the Titanic, they knew what was going on, and so when she sank, journalists were eager to get on the story, but it was the wrong story. A various plethora of newspapers reported that the Titanic had indeed hit an iceberg, but not that it had sank. Most of them reported all the passengers getting into lifeboats and the steamer being towed to Halifax. The New York Times was actually the only newspaper who reported the ship to have sunk and was hated on by all the other newspapers for the inaccuracy. Even the Wall Street Journal reported that the damage was bad, but the important point is that she did not sink. Her watertight bulkheads were really watertight. I mean, were they though? It was only a full two days later that newspapers learned the truth and then they were all looking pretty freaking dumb for chiding the New York Times. Now once the ship's signal ceased after its distress calls, people started to realize that it did in fact sink. So whether it's 2019 or 1912, 1000 years seems to make no difference since there's clearly fake news circulating all the bloody time. It is what it is, guys. Now, at number six are the engineers. Thanks to the dedicated Scottish and British engineers aboard the ship, a lot of people were saved. The men stayed behind it and worked effortlessly until the ship actually went under. The lights on the ship didn't even go out until it was fully underwater. The men spent the whole time keeping the pumps running and the electricity going, which helped the crew aboard get the passengers on the lifeboats. They also kept the radio running, which sent out distress signals up until a few minutes before the ship was completely submerged. Merged. One of the last signals heard by the Carpathia was engine room full up to boilers full of water. Out of the 25 engineers, not a single one survived. They were the real MVPs of this whole situation. I think we can agree. Coming in at number five is the bathroom situation. Now aboard the Titanic, there were three classes. First class that had various places to eat. They had their own gym, Turkish baths, a reading and writing room, and many more amenities. Then came second class and third class. And third class passengers were referred to as steerage passengers since they usually lodged below deck where the steering apparatus was located. Now four people shared a room in third class and they were provided food in a dining room which was pretty good considering most other ships would tell third class passengers to bring their own food. Each room had one basin between four people and there were only two bathtubs, as in for the whole class. Two bathtubs. There were around 700 to 1000 third class passengers all sharing two bathtubs. Like, Can you even imagine? Is that not against human rights? I feel like it is. And I doubt anyone would have been cleaning the third class bathtub so can you just imagine a how dirty they would have been and b how long the wait would have been for your turn to use it like can we just think about that for a minute this is a big deal like when I lived in dorms there was one bathtub between one floor of my house which was like 20 people but there were showers as well and no one really used the tubs anyway other than to throw up in but even 20 people I was like yeah I'm never using that but 700 to a thousand like nah nah b nah at number four is now you see it now you don't despite the Titanic being the biggest ship in the world, it somehow still took people 73 years to find its wreckage, which I don't even understand. Either way, sitting at 3,800 meters below the surface for more than a thousand years now, according to scientists, the whole wreckage could completely disappear by 2030. Since the wreckage is so deep, the ship stayed 
well preserved till 1985 but deteriorated a lot after that. While the deterioration has slowed considerably, a new proteobacteria was found on the rusted parts of the ship and tests confirmed that the bacteria could eat away the ship and erode it completely by 2030. Can you imagine? Like 50 years from now there's going to be no titanic, it's going to be one of those like small tidbit history facts that people of the future may or may not know. Not like how it is for us like this huge event that we all know like that's making me sad almost like people are just going to forget about it. Well, hmm. Contemplation, looking into the distance and dramatic eyes. <laughs> Filling our number three slot is Rhoda Mary Abbott. Rhoda was a third class passenger that was on the Titanic with her two sons, and she was the only female passenger that sank with the ship and actually survived. While it was going down, Rhoda was on the stern of the ship and was soon swept away from it. She surfaced and was able to swim to the collapsible A lifeboat and later rescued by the Carpathia, while her son sadly died at sea. But I never actually got this. Say you did go down with a ship while you're on the top deck, surely like would you not just float? And then could you not just swim to the lifeboats? But then, then again, hypothermia, so I get it. I get it. Now at number two is futility. 14 years before the Titanic set sail, the author Morgan Robertson wrote a novella called Futility about a ship sinking. That ship was called the Titan, and the whole story had eerily similar details to the Titanic. In the story, the Titan is the largest ship of its time, and so was the Titanic in reality. They were both roughly the same size, the Titanic being 25 meters longer. Both were described as unsinkable and both hit an iceberg mid-April. Both ships even carried the bare legal minimum number of lifeboats aboard despite having a ton of passengers, so it was just a lot of similarities that made you think like what? What is happening? I mean, even the names of both ships are just two letters off for God's sake. Like Morgan was even accused of being psychic, but he replied saying, I know what I'm writing about. That's literally all. He was an experienced seaman and he knew his subject matter and that's all it was. And although I believe Morgan, it's still really hella creepy. Kicking off our list at number 10, first class passengers. While traveling in first class, it might feel more comfortable at first, but when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. You would think, obviously, but here's why. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. That's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people passed away, but in hindsight, a lot of people made it. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats. And then afterwards, it was first class men. See, by that point, there were few lifeboats left, which I'll get into, of course, later on. But second class and third class, their chances at survival here, right off the bat, were not great, simply because they were divided by class. Being stored further and lower from these lifeboats, the odds weren't in their favor. There were more than 700 third class passengers, and that number exceeded the other two classes combined. It's horrible. Those rooms were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out, which we don't often think of when we think of, you know, the Titanic and the sinking of it. Number nine, the band. We know how passionate musicians can be and we know that music can heal a lot of people, of course. While I'm absolutely sure there is nothing that could have been done to completely erase people's worries about what was about to happen on the Titanic that fateful night, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. And I'm sure that helped somebody in some way, shape, or form. It wasn't just in the movie. Movie, right? The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up. First, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them too, but it turns out this is far from the truth. See, the band members were in fact not ship employees at the time, which means they technically had the same rights as any other passenger to leave and board a ship, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship, and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. The film can't quite capture the beauty. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who are also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad their acts have been remembered, even still. Number eight, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic that fateful night, and Tanky Magazine actually published her survival story afterwards, titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Yeah, I mentioned the first class differences between third class, so this story here is already a feat in itself. Ellen and her husband, Pecco, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound, and the engines then started to act up. Pecco ran out to see what was going on. The 
hallway was tilted by the time Aelin poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. Then there was a knock at the door. One of her friends from Finland came in and they said the ship was sinking. Pepeko was nowhere to be seen and her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway? All the doors are locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next. After a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to third deck where they were then taken to the Carpathia and they didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the following day. So after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Ilan only received $125. That's all the ship could give them. They're like, we're sorry you lost everything. Here's the best we can do. That's it. Number seven, no binoculars. On that fateful night of the collision with the iceberg, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Now, of course, this could have changed literal history had they have been used, but why weren't they? The key to set lockup, storing the binoculars, was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Now, of course, this may not have made a difference at all, but it's important to note. To think that these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest the entire time is haunting. Now, when you consider the history of it, the poor guy was trans transferred to another ship and he forgot a key. The amount of times I've forgotten a key or taken a work key home by accident, I mean, it's a simple mistake, but in this case, tragedy, really. Number six, ignored flares. Just 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice and the crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about icebergs. The Titanic had received six warnings about icebergs before the collision. Now while the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all six were. Why so? The captain of this other boat, he slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought that they were company rockets. The SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. Yep, he took a little power nap after ignoring all the flares. By the time they had heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was obviously too late, sadly. Number five, less lifeboats. Before the Titanic even set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. Why they did this? Beats me, I don't know. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we're talking about the safety of, I don't know, 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were, you know, collapsible. So 24-ish lifeboats, 2,208 passengers. Doesn't add up, it's not, uh, it's a terrible ratio. Which means they should have had time to launch every single one, but this would still be only enough for half the passengers on board. It was cursed from the get-go. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly, and it was chaos. There are quite a few lessons that can be definitely learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that safety precautions taken for these ships simply were just not up to par. It wasn't really about the iceberg. I mean, I mean, that did it, but there were other things that could have helped. Number four, the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marianne Meanwell. This must seem like any ordinary find after a wreck, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was then revealed that Marianne was not intended to be on the Titanic at all, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows us that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but for some reason, the trip she'd originally planned was delayed, and she instead was a signed to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see the word majestic was actually crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. It's, it's so haunting to look at now. There's no way anybody could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation to look back on. And to physically see the cancellation of the ship gives me goosebumps. That's really horrible. Number three, Eliza Melvina Dean. This story really is something. Okay, buckle up. When thinking back to this tragedy, it's hard to imagine how it looked in real time, like being on the ship, right? I mean, you know, not from James Cameron's perspective, right? It was a moonless night in the pitch black. Of course the navigation was hard, of course it could have been handled better, or they could have listened to the numerous warnings, but again, it was pitch black. This is what the iceberg looked like in real life. Eliza Dean was only a newborn on the Titanic. Her parents were on the way to the States with everything that they owned packed up in their luggage. See, Eliza's father was actually on the deck at the time of the collision, so he saw the ship hit that iceberg. How terrifying is that? But in doing so, he knew in that moment, get the family, hit the deck, something bad's gonna happen. Even as third class passengers, they were thankfully some of the first on the lifeboats, which is incredible seeing as what I said earlier. It was Eliza, her brother, and her mother. They all got aboard safely, but her father, of course, never made it off, which is terrible, but his quick thinking saved his family. 
Number 2. John Jacob Astor As the ship was sinking, the first class passenger, John Jacob Astor, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he immediately saw two terrified children standing behind him. And it happened. He instead gave up his spot and let those other two children on the boat, which is just noble, it's brave, it's heroic. I, it's something that you ask yourself, could I do that? If it actually were to happen, would I have the willpower to do that? I hope so. This is absolute bravery. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments later on after this brave moment. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. It's tragic. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news here is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety, and they survived the entire ordeal. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also don't hear enough about the bravery that people showed during this tragic event. And finally, number one, Molly Brown. In total, there were 706 people who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Molly Brown has been referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown. And when you look into her story, it really checks out. Margaret Brown not only survived the Titanic, which is just an incredible feat in itself, and it's the odds there are just incredible, but once aboard the life ship, she threatened the quartermaster. She said she'll throw him overboard if he didn't go back immediately and start looking for more survivors. That's bad. That, that is something I will do. I hope I can do in a moment like this. That's incredible. Historically, this is where the accounts get a little hazy. See, it's not confirmed whether the boat actually went back to look, but after narrowingly surviving a tragedy, then you're barely conscious. You still think of other people? That's the, that's the moral of the story here. Margaret was traveling in Egypt, but when a grandchild got sick, she ended her trip early just to go back to the States and take care of them. Once she got all this attention after surviving said disaster, she then campaigned publicly for women's rights and education for the poor. She was a badass in the boat and then a badass afterwards. Like, this is insane. There was a musical comedy in the 60s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. So her name will be remembered for a while. As it should be. Thank you, Molly. Start off this list in our number 10 spot. In 1898, a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man, it really is weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he he was, I guess it would have been kind of rude to just write a book about it rather than, I don't know, warn someone? Moving on to number 9. This is something that I actually didn't know, but apparently the entire accident of the Titanic totally could have and should have been avoided. In my head, I felt like this iceberg just kind of came up out of nowhere and surprised them, but that is not the case at all. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions of the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't blame them much. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. Moving on to number 8. This is a well-known fact that happened on that fatal night, but one that most definitely needed to be included on this list. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. Moving on to number 7. I know we talked about how not a lot was done with the warnings that were given about the icy water conditions, but when the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received 
received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently, this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely that they would have known at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't have turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They say that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly, which would have given more time for people to be rescued. I suppose this is just one case of hindsight being 2020. Moving on to number six. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ship started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida onto one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead, they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said, I will not be separated from my husband as we have lived so will we die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that they had each other in those very frightening moments. Moving on to number 5. The ship was carrying around 2,208 passengers at the time of the incident. That is obviously a lot of people. Before the ship set sail, however, in the preparation, they didn't want to clutter the deck, and the decision was made to reduce the number of lifeboats on board to just 20 with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This is only enough for half of the passengers on board, even if they were able to launch all of them. This decision was obviously extremely detrimental, and it is possible that many more people could have been saved if it wasn't for this. I wonder if anyone who was on the ship at the time knew about this previous decision that had been made, because that would be so irritating. I think throughout this list it has become very clear that the safety preparations for this cruise were just not up to par, but I guess that is just a lesson learned for all of us. Moving on to number 4. The Titanic had a well stocked bar as it had 1500 bottles of wine, 8000 cigars, and 20,000 bottles of beer on board. One less than great thing about this is the fact that all of the alcohol was only reserved for first class passengers. I suppose this isn't the worst thing in the world as no one needs alcohol, but it certainly seems a little rude. Most of the people who passed away on the night that the Titanic sank didn't die from drowning, but rather the icy temperatures of the water. I mentioned the alcohol in the cold water because of one passenger named Charles. Charles was actually the baker on the ship and when he found out that the ship was most dead definitely done for, he decided to indulge himself in the bar as he was known to enjoy a whiskey or two. Considering he thought he was about to meet his end, he may have overindulged and found himself quite drunk actually. Well, after the ship sank, Charles was found two hours later, still treading water and relatively unscathed. It turns out that the alcohol slowed his heat loss, so he was able to survive the terribly cold water until he could be rescued. Who would have thought that getting drunk would actually turn out to save your life? Life. Moving on to number three. The time from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills, so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. There were even two boats that never got launched at all. This is obviously terrible because there are so many people who potentially could have been saved had this delay never happened. I also just can't imagine how frightening it would be to be in the middle of that emergency with absolutely no direction at all. Moving on to number 2. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats.
lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble but also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal. I'm sure if John's spirit is still around somewhere, that is all he truly cared about at the end of the day. Moving on to number one. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured that they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had already gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously. It is obviously not their fault, but it does make you think. Let's get started with number 10, first in fiction. So an English newspaper editor named William T. Stead was traveling on the Titanic to New York. He was going to address a conference at Carnegie Hall at the request of President William Howard Taft, but him boarding the ship was surprising in itself. In 1886, he had written a short fictional piece called How the Atlantic Mail Steamer Went Down. Like the Titanic, it was about a transatlantic liner that had sunk when carrying many passengers and it also lacked lifeboats. In the fictional piece, many people drowned. He believed it could one day become a reality and he did meet his own fate in that way as well. Next at number 9 we have Beware of Water. So a first class passenger named Edith Corse Evans was returning to New York City aboard the Titanic. The cousins she traveled with were a group of sisters and the four women together befriended Colonel Archibald Gracie. On the evening that the Titanic struck the iceberg, men on the vessel tried to reassure the ladies that the ship was unsinkable, but Edith remembered something a fortune teller told her. Edith told the colonel that her warning from the fortune teller was to beware of water. Edith was convinced that the prophecy held some truth. Even with that warning, accounts of the disaster say she gave up her seat in a lifeboat for one of the sisters she was traveling with, as that friend had children waiting for her at home. It's very nice of her, and it was honored on her tombstone. At number 8 we have George and Edith Vanderbilt. So this Vanderbilt couple was set to sail on the RMS Titanic. Their their footman, Edwin Charles Wheeler, even loaded their belongings into the ship two days before it was due to set sail because they were due to travel first class. The couple had traveled quite a bit to decorate their home with things from around the world, and this was another voyage coming back from where they were traveling. But then a family member disproved their plan to travel aboard the Titanic. They said so many things can go wrong on a maiden voyage. So the Vanderbilts rebooked onto Olympic, but their footman Edwin decided to travel on the Titanic and sadly lost his life when the ship sank. On to number seven, a gut feeling. Chief Officer Henry Wilde joined the trip across the sea on the Titanic as a last minute addition to the crew, but he was less than thrilled about his assignment. He mailed his sister a letter during the ship's final stopover in Ireland where he said, I still don't like the ship, I have a queer feeling about it. And then after that, he sadly became a victim of the Titanic sinking. But his addition to the crew might have been a domino effect in the disaster. Since he was hired last minute, other officers were demoted and one was let go. The one let go was David Blair, who took the key to a cupboard with him. Probably accidentally, but it was an important key. It unlocked the cupboard for the binoculars that were intended for use at the Titanic's lookout. So the crew, as they didn't break open the lock to get into the cupboard, they scanned the open seas without any help, not using the binoculars and not spotting the iceberg sooner. On to number six, loving life. So this premonition falls hand in hand with common sense. A survivor of the sinking of the Titanic, Renee Harris, claimed that a handsome stranger warned her about the voyage. He asked her if she loved life, and she said yes. In response, he said, then you will get off the ship at Cherbourg if we get that far, and that's what I'm gonna do. And yes, he did get off the ship, supposedly, but Harris and her husband did not. Unfortunately, her husband passed away after she didn't heed the warning. The reason I say this went along with common sense is because the passengers had seen the Titanic nearly collide with the city of New York steamer vessel. By only 
72 inches. If I had seen that, I would have hopped off too. 72 inches just shows that something in the steering may not have been quite right. On to number five, the hearts. So the family was one that was on the voyage as second class passengers that planned to start a new life in Winnipeg. So the child, Eva Hart, remembered her mother Esther had a bad feeling about the ship. Her mother said that deeming the ship unsinkable was flying in the face of God. Esther Hart would sleep during the day and stay awake at night in case she heard a bump, and she did. Her vigilance saved her daughter's life and her own. The father and the family gave up his spot for the other women and children to flee and gave his coat to his wife for warmth. Both Esther and Ava made it across safely. At number four, a voice in his head. When Alex McKenzie was walking along the gangway to board the Titanic, a voice in his head shared a warning. It said he would lose his life if he stayed on the liner. He looked around and didn't see anyone that could be the voice, so he shook it off. But the warning didn't stop and he heard the voice a second, and then a third time. Each time it was stronger than the time before. At that point he decided to turn back and return to his home in Glasgow, Scotland. And since it was a luxurious maiden voyage with second or third class ticket he received from his grandparents as a gift, his family wasn't too happy to see him return. But their mood swiftly changed when they heard the news of the disaster. Next at number three we have foreboding. So John Coffey hopped aboard the ship at Southampton since he signed on to serve as a stoker or boiler room foreman for five pounds a month. He was scheduled for the trip across the Atlantic, but he hopped off during the stop at Queenstown, Ireland, also his hometown. Weeks after the ship met its end, he said it was because he felt a strange foreboding about the voyage. After that, he signed on to work on another ship. For this one, I would not be surprised if this person maybe made up their story to cover up the fact they were hitching a ride on the ship by working and ditching their contract early for a free ride home. Or maybe they did sense foreboding and were like, I'm going to go home to my family because that feels safer. It could be either way. Next at number two, we have another Edith. Third one of the video. Popular name. So Edith Rosenbaum, aka Edith Russell, was a first class passenger traveling on the RMS Titanic. She did at one point say the boat was the most wonderful boat you could think of, but she also said she had a feeling she couldn't get over. A feeling of depression and a premonition of trouble. Edith did survive the disaster along with her musical toy pig though. Reportedly, the music that came from the toy provided comfort to the fellow passengers as they waited for help on the lifeboat for four hours. She continued she continued to travel extensively throughout her life after that and survived tornadoes, car accidents, and another shipwreck. So maybe her premonitions were helping her. Last but not least at number one, Futility. So Morgan Robertson wrote a book called Futility or the Wreck of the Titan in 1898. Although it was written 14 years before the disaster and that it was 100% fiction, it had many parallels to the real life event. It was about the Titan, the largest luxury liner in the world. And yes, the name is already similar. But here's the kicker, Robertson wrote that the liner sank in the North Atlantic Ocean after hitting an iceberg. Hmm. So after the event, Robertson denied he had any psychic abilities and that he was working off knowledge alone. He knew of shipbuilding trends and the dangers that modern ships then faced. But still, the similarities are uncanny. Both were seen for the most part as unsinkable, were about 270 meters long, could go as fast as 20 knots, and had a barely legal number of lifeboats. Both even sank 400 nautical miles away from Newfoundland, Canada on an April evening. I wish the crew of the Titanic had read that book so that they could keep an eye out because that one's just scary accurate. Starting us off at number 10, we have the final resting place. When it comes to Titanic related hauntings, it should come as no big surprise that the actual site where the tragedy occurred is considered one of the most haunted spots of all. According to those who have visited since the fateful day, strange sights such as odd glowing orbs of light can be seen floating around at night, and many believe they are actually the spirits of those who died at sea. But that's not all. Deep sea vessels that have explored the area near the sinking have reported to receive eerie, faint SOS calls that fade in and out, and seem to have no traceable source. Could they be the ghosts of the fallen crying out for help? Many definitely believe so. Now, orbs of light and radio static are nowhere near unheard of when it comes to suspected paranormal activity, especially when you're dealing with a place such as this, where so many people have perished. However, the most terrifying curse of all has to do with an old legend that says if you aren't careful, 
example, the lonely ghosts in the sea may just pull you overboard to live the rest of eternity with them. So just be safe if you are sailing in the area. Coming in at number 9, Titanic's Builder. Inside the Titanic exhibit in the Luxor Hotel is a portrait of a man named J. Bruce Ismay, who was one of the builders of the Titanic many years ago. However, the thing about Ismay was that he's not really what you would describe as a hero. Apparently he fled the sinking ship leaving women and their families behind, and witnesses on the lifeboats claim he kept his back to the ship as it descended. But worst of all, it said he was the one insisting the ship speed up after receiving ice warnings. And as a result, it's believed he is not terribly liked by the ghosts who did not survive the disaster. In fact, one morning in particular, as the crew came in to open the exhibit, they found the portrait portrait of Ismay on the floor. When the manager watched the surveillance video from the night before, he was stunned to see the picture began shaking before coming off of the wall seemingly all by itself. Many believe that those who perished that night haunt the exhibit, tearing down his photo. And some believe that if you aren't careful, they may just curse you for being associated with him. Coming in at number 8, No Pope. So this next one is kind of a full conspiracy, but you know what? I just couldn't help myself. Apparently one of the myths that supports the idea that the ship was cursed comes from the ship's number. The number in question was allegedly 390904, but some Catholic employees who built the ship were distressed at the time as the number, when viewed in a mirror, appears to say no pope. Apparently this meant that the ship was cursed and godless in their eyes, and that coupled with someone allegedly saying that God could not sink the ship made for one giant cursed vessel. To be honest, I'm not sure how much of this myth is based in fact and how much of it is a glorified legend, but I'm not out to tempt fate in the same way the Titanic did all those years ago. Coming in at number 7, Ghost of the Titanic. One can assume that there are as many ghosts as there were fatalities associated with the infamous sinking of the ship, but one of the most famous is thought to be that of Frederick Fleet. Frederick was a British sailor serving as the lookout aboard the RMS Titanic, and it was Frederick who actually spotted the deadly iceberg and warned the bridge. But tragically, as we know, his warning came too late and the ship was not able to avoid the disastrous collision. However, the saddest part was that although Fleet survived the sinking of the Titanic, he suffered deeply from depression in part to his survivor's guilt, and tragically his depression only grew worse over time. Finally, after his wife's passing just after Christmas in 1964, and the shortly followed eviction from his brother-in-law, Frederick took his own life. Following his death, he was buried, but strangely his grave remained unmarked until the Titanic Historical Society erected a headstone for him in 1993. These days, however, it appears his spirit is not quite at rest, as witnesses have claimed to see him keeping watch over the Las Vegas exhibition's promenade deck, perhaps driven by his guilt to watch even in the afterlife. Next up at number 6, a ghost on board. Back in 1977, second officer Leonard Bishop of the SS Winterhaven gave a tour of the ship to a man who he naturally assumed was a passenger. Apparently the man was British and very soft spoken, but extremely interested in every detail of the vessel, almost unusually so. Bishop found the man to be a bit strange, but didn't think much of it, and continued to tour him around. But it wasn't until a few years later when he saw a photo of Titanic Captain Edward John Smith that Officer Bishop realized why the situation felt so off. Allegedly, he exclaimed to a friend, I know him, I gave him a tour of my boat. But the friend laughed and explained to his friend that the man had been long dead and that the man he claimed to know was the captain of the Titanic. Turns out the captain still remains at sea and likes to check up on the passing boats. Let's just hope he's not looking to be vengeful. 
Coming in at number 5, Lady in Black. Almost any haunted location has some kind of Lady in Black. I'm not sure exactly why, but it just happens to be part of the brand. And the Titanic Artifact Exhibition is no exception. Employees and guests alike all claim to have seen this mysterious woman. And it's said she wears a black period dress with a white collar and her hair in a bun. However, the most eerie of stories surrounding this ghost has to do with a photographer. Reportedly, he was getting ready for the opening of an exhibition when he spotted this woman casually walking down the grand staircase. He was understandably startled as he hadn't noticed anyone enter and the staircase was roped off, but he just assumed he must have missed her come in and that she was a part of the exhibit. So trying to be friendly, he asked if she'd like him to photograph her, but she ignored him. So he went back to setting up, but suddenly she was directly behind him. So again, he offered a photograph. But this time, she didn't just ignore him, she vanished right before his very eyes. It's believed she is a ghost of a woman who died on the ship, and while no one knows exactly who she might be, let's just hope she's not a dangerous spirit. Next up at number 4, A Premonition. As the legend goes, on the very same night the ship went down, a young Scottish woman by the name of Jessie was on the verge of dying. It's said that in her delirious state, she supposedly spoke of a massive sinking ship and a man named Wally playing a fiddle, despite the fact that she would have no way of knowing the Titanic would sink that night. Unless she was placing some kind of curse, that is. I have to say the most insane part of the legend is that a man named Wallace, aka Wally Hartley, did indeed play his violin one last time as he and his band went down with the ship. Let's just hope some women on her deathbed wasn't the reason this all happened. Coming in at number 3, The Unlucky Mummy. One of the most well known alleged curses surrounding the Titanic is that of the unlucky mummy. Now, for a little context, approximately a thousand years before the time of Christ, a woman who has since been dubbed a priestess of the College of Amun Ra was born in the city of Thebes, Egypt. And it is believed this mummy is her embalmed body. Now, in terms of the unluckiness surrounding her mummy, in in the late 1890s, archaeologists discovered the burial site during a dig near Egypt's lost city of Luxor. According to legend, a rich Englishman arranged for the purchase of the mummy and her casket. However, as reported by the Museum of Unnatural History, the man inexplicably vanished before his purchase could be delivered. Then later, all three of his travel companions suffered misfortune. One of the men died, another was disabled in an accident, and the third suffered financial ruin. From that day forward, it was believed that anyone or anything that this mummy came into contact with would be cursed by misfortune. And rumors suggest that the mummy was eventually purchased by an American archaeologist who arranged for it to be transported to the United States aboard the Titanic. So for all we know, some ancient cursed mummy could have cursed the ship and sent it to its dark fate. Coming in at number 2, Missing Tourists. If there was ever an argument to be made for scary curses surrounding the Titanic, then this next story is probably the one I would pick. You may or may not have seen and heard the terrifying story that is unfolding as we speak, but essentially there was a tourist submarine that set out to tour the wreckage of the Titanic that has now been missing for over 48 hours. The missing vessel has five people on board, including British billionaire Hamish Harding, French diver Paul-Henri Nargola, Pakistani entrepreneur Shadza Dawood with his son, and the final passenger is believed to be Stockton Rush, the founder of Ocean Gate Expeditions. The submarine dove down on Sunday morning, but after only an hour and 45 minutes into the tour, they lost all communication. Now, besides the obviously nerve wracking part of this all, what is really scary is that, according to Ocean Gate's website, the submarine can only last for up to 96 hours underwater with five people consuming oxygen. So the clock is ticking for the search and rescue team to try and track down the disappearing vessel before it's too late. It is truly a horrific and nightmare inducing situation, and many believe that the waters surrounding the haunted ship are to blame. And 
last up in our number one spot today is the wreck of the Titan. There are many conspiracy theories surrounding the Titanic, one being that it never actually set sail, another being that it deliberately sunk, but to be honest, none of them really hold much validity. However, there is one interesting conspiracy theory, and that is that a man named Morgan Robertson actually predicted and potentially even cursed the infamous ship when he published his novel The Wreck of the Titan in 1898, 14 years before the real life disaster. Now, to be clear, Robertson rejected any claim stating that he had something to do with the disaster, and insisted he was just drawing on his own real life experiences as a sailor. But I have to admit, some of the similarities between his story and the real life events are a little creepy. For example, even if you ignore that they had similar names, the fictitious Titan, like the Titanic, was supposed to be the largest of its kind and an unsinkable ship. Plus, it also lacked enough lifeboats to accommodate its passenger load, and struck an iceberg while going too fast in the North Atlantic. And as if that weren't strangely similar enough, both disasters took place in April and cost thousands of people their lives. So do you think this book was some kind of curse on the ship, or just a really creepy coincidence? Kicking off list at number 10, First Class. While traveling in first class may feel more comfortable when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats, and then it was first class men. By that point, there were a few lifeboats left, which I'll get into later on, that's a whole thing. But second class and third class, their chances at survival were not great. Being stored further and lower away from these lifeboats, it took longer to get there, especially with the rush and the crowds too, it was chaos. There were more than 700 third class passengers, that number exceeded the other two classes combined. And those rooms were horrible, they were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and each of the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out. Number nine. Locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic April 15, 1912, and back in September 1987, Tanky Magazine published her survival story. It was titled Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Ellen and her husband Pecco decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound and the engine started to act up a bit. Pecco left the room to go and see what was going on. The hallway was tilted by the time Ellen poked her head out moments later once you heard a ruckus in the hallway. There was then a knock at the door, one of her friends from Finland came, and they said the ship was sinking, but Pekka was nowhere to be seen at this point. He was still gone. Her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway in the first place, because all the doors are now locked. I was confused, I didn't know what to do next, and after a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to the third deck where they were taken to the Carpathia. They didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the next morning. And after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Aileen received $125. That's horrible, after that entire night, they're like, here's some money. That would be around four grand now, which is not enough to fix anything. Number eight, record time. It's been noted by many survivors that the Titanic was traveling quite fast, faster than anything they've experienced before. Well, that's because the ship's captain, Edward J. Smith, was trying to beat the crossing time of the Titanic's older White Star sibling. Now, there were already concerns about icebergs at this point, but the fact that the captain still went ahead at full speed, regardless of all the oncoming icebergs, well, sure didn't help. Astronomers at Texas State University at San Marcos discovered something cosmic that may have had something to do with the sinking of the Titanic that night. The alignment of the sun, the moon, and us on Earth could have created higher than normal tides in the Atlantic Ocean around January 1912. So by the time the Titanic was whipping through months later, icebergs that used to be stuck in the Labrador Sea could have gotten in the way. It also would have helped to see the iceberg approaching from afar, but number seven, no binoculars. On the night of the collision, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Of course, this could have possibly changed history, so why weren't they used? Where were they? Well, the key to the lockup was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Of course, this may not have made a difference at all, you know, with all things considered, but it's important to note. To think these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest this entire time is actually pretty haunting. Poor guy was transferred to another ship and forgot to give the key back. The amount of times I've taken a work key home with me, honestly, it's a simple mistake, so this is 
tragic. Number six, wrong turn. It's the middle of the night, there aren't any binoculars at disposal, it's high tides, it's hard to see, but did the steersman accidentally point the Titanic towards the iceberg? Well, back in 2010, Louise Patton said this story was passed down from her grandfather, who just happened to be the most senior ship officer that survived that disaster. Apparently what happened was the iceberg was seen, and of course there was little time given the speed of the ship at that point, so command immediately issued to turn hard a starboard. That command was passed down a line like broken telephone. It was screamed past multiple people, so eventually the command was received as make the ship turn right, rather than push the tiller to the right, which would have made the ship go left. It's confusing, and also at that moment, it's hard to hear. There's no chance, this is anyone's fault. Number five, not enough lifeboats. Before the Titanic set sail, at some point, a decision was made to reduce the number of lifeboats on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, and, and looking back now, it's honestly haunting to think that was once a thought, like that mattered at all. It just ruined the aesthetic, like, okay, sure. The safety of 2,208 passengers aboard, we could use some more boats. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were collapsible. 24 lifeboats, that's it. This meant that should they even have time to launch every single boat, this would only still be enough for half the passengers on board. Only half. And that's if it worked perfectly at that point. Even when the Titanic was going down, none of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything unfolded quickly. Number four, staying warm. The Titanic was obviously quite fancy. Its dining selections were fancy, the wines were fancy, it was all fancy, but alcohol was sadly reserved only for first class. The bar had 1,500 bottles of wine and 20,000 bottles of beer. Most of the people who passed away that night, it was because of icy temperatures in the water. I mentioned the alcohol in the cold water because one passenger named Charles Jogan, Charles was the baker on the ship, and when he realized the fate of the ship, it was probably going down, he drank everything he could see. He just chugged as much as he can. Honestly, I'm on board with drinking responsibly and all that, but if this was the case, yeah, of course, go for it. You don't want to be sober when this is happening. Charles was found two hours after the ship had completely gone down, somehow still treading water, and also somehow alive, and also extremely drunk. What happened here was the alcohol, the rather large amount of alcohol, slowed his heat loss, so he was able to hold on until help arrived, luckily. Number three, a helping hand. John Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that night. Now as the ship was sinking, he put his wife on one of the lifeboats, but as he was about to get in himself with her, he saw two children standing behind him. Of course, they were petrified. So John, John Astor, he gave up his spot and let those two children take his instead. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock later saw John and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts trying to keep each other warm, but they both sadly didn't make it. A sad story of course, but John's wife and the child that she was carrying at the time both survived and made it to safety. Number two, an alternate trip. Not much was found of the Titanic afterwards. The pressure of the ocean, all those many secrets are truly lost to history. But there was an inspection card found. It belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. Now this may seem like a mundane find at first, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that night, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of those passengers. The card shows that originally she was supposed to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but due to a coal strike, the Majestic voyage was delayed, and she instead was then assigned to the Titanic. On Marion's card, you can see Majestic crossed out, and the new trip says Titanic. It's grim, it's very heartbreaking. And finally, number one, ignored flares. Barely 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice. The crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about the icebergs. The Titanic had actually received about six warnings before the collision. Only the first few were received by the captain. Now the captain of this other boat slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought they were company rockets. And the SOS signals that the Titanic sent out as well weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was of course too late. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Mont Blanc and Emo. Halifax is a port city that is located here in Canada in the province of Nova Scotia. Halifax was a super important place during the First World War as it acted as a hotspot for ships that were carrying supplies, troops, ammunition, you know, war stuff. On December 6, 1917, a Norwegian ship called Emo left Halifax and it ended up colliding with a French ship called the Mont Blanc. 
Blanc. This is already disastrous, but it was made significantly worse by the fact that the Mont Blanc held explosives. Because of the collision, the Mont Blanc was pushed towards the shore and ended up setting the harbour front ablaze. Just a few minutes later, the entire ship exploded with a blast so strong that windows 50 miles away were shattered. Unfortunately, there were many, many people at the waterfront when the explosion happened, which led to 1,800 people dying in this accident. 9,000 people were injured, and it is said that 1,600 homes were destroyed in the blast. The force of this blast really cannot be understated. It was so powerful that it caused a tidal wave and violent tremors, which were able to uproot trees from out of the ground. They damaged railroad tracks, and they destroyed numerous buildings whose debris was scattered for hundreds of yards. In the end, this is what made this explosion one of the most violent non-nuclear explosions in history, and what makes it likely the world's largest accidental man-made explosion. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Toya Maru. This ship was a Japanese train ferry that was out to sea in between the islands of Hokkaido and Honshu in 1954 when it was struck by Typhoon Marie. The captain tried to ride it out and attempted to anchor the ship in place, but the winds were so strong that it broke free. Seawater began pouring into the engine compartment, which then caused the steam engine to quit running and the ferry was then completely uncontrollable. The captain continued to try whatever he could to get the ship to safety and he even tried to beach the ship, but unfortunately the waves were just too powerful. After being tossed around in the waves and battered by the water, and after all the rain and strong winds, the ship ended up capsizing and sinking. In the end, 1,163 people lost their lives in this disaster, including 35 American soldiers who are members of the US Army's 1st Cavalry Division Artillery. The Toya Maru wasn't the only ship sunk in this storm, as Typhoon Marie also sank four other ferries as well. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Taiping Steamer. In 1949, the Taiping Steamer was out to sea and was seriously overloaded with 1,000 war refugees on board. This ship was sailing from Shanghai, China to Keelung, Taiwan when it collided with a cargo vessel called the Qianyuang. At the time of this accident, the Taiping was fleeing the Chinese Civil War, which is why it was so overcrowded, when it only should have been holding a maximum of 580 passengers. This kind of overcrowding did not help with the sinking of the ship and sadly only sped up the process. It is also said that the ship was steaming without lights, even though it was after curfew, which of course likely didn't help to avoid this very tragic situation. Sadly, there were 1,500 people who lost their lives in this collision. In our number 7 spot today, we have the SS Principe Umberto. This ship was built in 1909 as an Italian passenger ship, but in the times during the First World War, it ended up being converted into an armed merchant cruiser. On June 8, 1916, this ship was transporting troops on the Adriatic Sea. These troops were part of the 55th Infantry Regiment and were on their way back from Albania to Italy. Although the ship was accompanied by others, it still ended up being struck by an Austro-Hungarian U-5 submarine that had launched a torpedo attack. This ship ended up sinking just minutes later and it is said that this disaster took the lives of 1,926 men, making it the worst naval disaster of the First World War in terms of lives lost. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Yamato. This ship was a Japanese battleship that served in the Second World War. She was the lead ship of her class of battleships, and she was one of the two of the heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever constructed. On April 7th, 1945, the ship was about 300 kilometers south of the Japanese island of Kyushu when it was confronted by a U.S. carrier-based aircraft. This aircraft bombed the ship, which led to it capsizing. This then caused the ammunition on board to explode, which tore the ship in two. After a total of 13 torpedo hits and eight hits, the ship completely sunk. The ship was accompanied by a light cruiser and four other destroyers, which were all sunk in this event as well. This sadly led to thousands of deaths as most of the crew lost their lives in this battle. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Joseph Stalin. The Joseph Stalin was, of course, a Soviet passenger ship that was converted to carry troops during the Second World War. The ship was very important to Soviet forces as it was used in 1941 in the evacuation of Tallinn and was later used to evacuate the Soviet naval base in Hango. Finland. Just after this evacuation, on December 3rd, 1941, the ship ended up entering the Gulf of Finland where it encountered three German mines. This led to the crew scrambling around to try and fix up the damage that the mines had caused. While they were distracted by this, Finnish forces ended up spotting the ship and saw an opportunity to strike. This led to the ammunition that was on board the Soviet ship to detonate, which ended up taking the lives of 3,849 out of the 5,589 who were on board. 
forward. Those who didn't lose their lives in this incident ended up being captured and held as prisoners of war by the German forces. In our number 4 spot today we have the SS Cap Arcona. This ship was a German luxury ocean liner that was launched in 1927. But by the time the mid 1940s rolled around however, like many other ships on this list, this one was put to use to help in the country's war efforts. This time, this ship was converted into a prison ship. In April of 1945, with the advance of the British Army, prisoners being held at concentration camps were being loaded onto ships and the Cap Arcona was one of them. On May 3rd, 1945, with more than 6,000 people on board, the ship was attacked by the British Air Force. The prisoners on board were being held below deck at the time and the ship was not marked with any sort of red cross, so unfortunately those in the British Air Force did not realize that the ship was filled with prisoners at the time. The ship capsized but did not sink entirely, but still this wreck caused somewhere around 5,000 deaths. In our number 3 spot today we have the HMS Armenia. This was a Soviet passenger ship that was first launched in November of 1928 and she had a maximum capacity of 980 passengers. During the second world war this ship was put to use by transporting troops and from October 9th 1941 the ship was used to evacuate soldiers, workers and materials from Odessa. In November of 1941 there was the invasion of German troops that led to an extreme rush to evacuate the hospitals in the city of Sevastopol and the Armenia was repurposed again into a hospital ship. This led to about 4,000 wounded people and medical personnel from 11 different hospitals being loaded onto the ship to set sail towards Yalta. Once there, another 1,000 passengers were loaded onto the ship in a rush, none of which were officially recorded. On November 7th, the ship was attacked by a German Heinkel HE-111 and in just four minutes, the ship sadly sank, taking the lives of almost everyone on board. Just eight people survived the entire ordeal. In German records, there is no mention that the Armenia was a hospital ship, so it's unclear if they omitted that tale or if they mistakenly believed that it was a troop carrier. Either way, it is absolutely devastating. In our number two spot today, we have the Arctic. This ship made its maiden transatlantic voyage in 1850, and it was best known for its speed. This ship was able to cross the Atlantic in just nine days. On on September 27th, 1854, the ship was sailing from Liverpool to New York City when it collided with a French steamship called the Vesta. This occurred in the thick fog that was found just off of Cape Race, Newfoundland. At first it appeared as though the Vesta had received more damage in the collision, but soon the captain of the Arctic realized that the ship was rapidly taking on seawater. He decided to abandon the Vesta and head for land in order to save his passengers, but once he left the other ship, the damaged Arctic continued to take on water, which then put out the first furnaces and caused engines to stop working. This is when the captain ordered that those who were the most vulnerable be placed into the lifeboats first, but instead a number of crew and male passengers dashed towards the lifeboats, leaving hundreds of people to go down with the ship. There were about 400 people on board the ship that day and only 87 of them survived. 22 of the survivors were passengers and the rest crew. The captain went down with the ship, but he managed to stay alive by clinging to some wreckage until rescue came. The other ship, the Vesta, did not sink and ended up making it to St. John's, Newfoundland. The crew members who abandoned everyone else on the ship were criticized for their behavior, which violated the laws that forbid sailors to put their own safety before that of passengers in emergencies. Despite this, however, none of the men were prosecuted for their actions. In our number one spot today, we have the RMS Lancastria. This ship was a British ocean liner, but in April of 1940, she was reconstructed to be a troop ship under the command of Captain Rudolf Sharp. He sent the ship off to help aid in the evacuation of British troops and citizens from France, and on June 14th, 1940, the ship departed from Liverpool. On June 16th, the ship anchored near the town of Saint-Nazaire, and the following day, somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 refugees loaded on board. This included civilians, soldiers, and other military officials. While carrying all of these people, around 4 p.m. on June 17th, the German Junkers Ju-88 the ship, which caused it to capsize and sink in an extremely fast 20 minutes. This caused over 1,400 tons of fuel to leak into the water, some parts catching fire, and while there were 2,477 survivors, no one is quite sure how many people lost their lives. This is because it was obviously a hectic rescue mission that had people rushing aboard. No one is quite sure just how many people were on board before the attack happened. It is thought that somewhere from 4,000 to 6,500 people might have 
have lost their lives during this, which is truly a terrifying number. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the vanishing remains. It's been over 30 years since the Titanic wreck was found, and recently scientists have made another startling discovery. As it turns out, the remains of the wreckage don't have much time left. As we speak, they are currently vanishing. The ocean liner, which is over 100 years old, has not only been beaten by the currents of the deep sea, but the main culprit for its deterioration is an iron hungry bacteria that consumes hundreds of pounds of iron a day. This bacteria, which has been named Halomonas titanicae, is likely going to render the ship completely eroded by 2030. This means that researchers who want to discover more about the Titanic really are racing against time to get down there and see all that they can before the remains are gone, and the story of the Titanic remains just that. In our number 9 spot today, we have portholes. Since the Titanic sunk, people have been trying to figure out exactly how this unsinkable ship sank and how it sank so quickly. A recent study may have found a previously undiscussed scenario that likely contributed to the speed of the sinking ship greatly. On that fateful day, of course, the Titanic grinded to a halt, and at that point, the passengers had no idea why. This led to many of them opening up the portholes in the ship to get a look out in case they could see anything that would be stopping them from continuing on their journey. Many of those who opened the portholes didn't close them after, and with every open porthole that went underwater, it is estimated that it doubled the size of the damage to the ship. It is possible that these open windows may have caused the ship to sink at double the rate it would have had those windows been closed. Of course, this is not to blame the passengers, however, as this tragedy is certainly not their fault. In our number 8 spot today, we have the brittle fracture. This is another one of those theories behind how the Titanic found itself at the bottom of the North Atlantic. There was an expedition down to the wreckage of the Titanic recently, and it revealed something interesting about the hull of the ship. There were these large pieces of steel that were recovered, each with about three rivet holes 1.25 inches in diameter. These pieces revealed that the hull's iron rivets failed to brittle fracture, which is the sudden and rapid snapping. This means that there was a failure in the structural materials, and this usually happens as a result of low temperature, high impact loading, and high sulfur content all three of which were present on the night of the tragedy. The water temperature was below freezing, the Titanic was traveling at a high speed upon impact with the iceberg, and the hull steel contained high levels of sulfur. These chunks of metal gave researchers one of the main answers as to why the Titanic sunk that night. In our number 7 spot today, we have rich remains. When we think of the story of the Titanic, we of course think of the sinking of the ship, we talk about how the survivors were saved, and then of course we think of the catastrophic loss of life. Many people don't stop to ask what happened with all of those who passed away in the tragedy, however. More than 1,500 people passed away in the sinking of the Titanic, and only 337 bodies were pulled from the water. A scholar named Jess Beer has recently examined what was done with those bodies, and throughout this research, Research, they have come to realize that whether or not these people got identified and what happened to the remains in the end all depended on their class and economic standing in life. About one third of the recovered bodies ended up being returned to the sea because rescuers didn't think that they would get any sort of life insurance payout from the families of those who had passed and who were of a lower economic standing. For any bodies to be preserved for land burial, the remains had to be easily identifiable and they needed to have a quote, economic value even after death with a high social or economic worth. In our number 6 spot today, we have the unidentified passenger. Until about 10 years ago, there were human remains that were recovered from the Titanic sinking that were unidentified despite researchers' best efforts. Initially, there was one identity that they thought they could link the body to, but there were also five other identities on the table, and no one was sure how to confirm who this person really was. A little over a decade ago, however, using mitochondrial DNA testing, the re-examining of the DNA gave a 98 8.87% certainty the unknown person was in fact a passenger named Sidney Goodwin. A man named Ryan Parr is heavily credited with helping bring this mystery to a close, although he insists it couldn't have been done without the help of numerous researchers and scientists who also worked to reveal this passenger's true identity. In our number 5 spot today, we have family ties. Lorraine Allison was just 2 years old when she boarded the Titanic with her family, her parents, and her brother. At the time of the sinking, it is said that Lorraine's brother was rushed 
to a lifeboat, but that the other three members of the family had passed in the tragedy. Despite this, only Lorraine's father's body was found, which led to the question of what happened to Lorraine and her mother. 28 years later, a woman named Helen Kramer came forward and said that she, in fact, was the missing Lorraine. Of course, people were skeptical and weren't willing to believe this, but until her death in 1992, Helen continued to claim that she was, in fact, Lorraine. After her passing, her granddaughter, Debrina Woods, resurfaced the claims by saying that she had inherited more evidence from her grandmother and that the truth should be told. Finally, a group of Titanic researchers with the power of modern science decided that they all wanted to solve this mystery once and for all. They did this by convincing descendants from each family to take a DNA test, and once this was done, they were able to prove that there was no relationship between the two. They were finally able to put this long disputed claim to rest officially. In our number four spot today, we have the Telegraph. So you know how people often explain that perhaps many more people would have been saved from the Titanic wreck if the nearby SS Californian had their telegraph operator awake when the distress call was sent? For the man who went to sleep, that's a heavy burden to bear for the rest of your life. But a recent study suggests that even if he was awake, there likely wouldn't have been anything that he could have done. Firstly, there wasn't any rule stating that this guy needed to be awake for 24 hours to man the telegraph machine. So right here, he is off the hook. This study, however, suggests that even if he was awake and the ship received the distress call, the ice around the Titanic was so thick they likely wouldn't have been able to get through to save the passengers either way. Turns out that this disaster really just had the perfect recipe for tragedy. In our number three spot today, we have the Titanic radio. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment Department, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it does appear as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but of course the pandemic delayed things quite a bit, so at this point it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number two spot today, we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and they could have warned her. Her. If Marion's body was ever recovered, unfortunately, she has never been identified. In our number one spot today, we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land, where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout Frederick Fleet in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, quote, well, enough to get out of the way.